But it's my pleasure today to um, welcome Dr. Shasti Lerner from the University of Oslo, who is kicking off our, for our, our All Souls at Home seminar series um, for this term. So today, Shashi is going to be talking to us about her recent book, her work um, on human rights NGOs in international criminal justice. And I think I'm just going to hand straight over to you and so you can share your screen and start us off. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Let me see if I can. Yeah, is it showing now? Yeah. Super. So hi, everybody, and thank you for the introduction, Mary, and for the invitation, not the least. I'm, of course, very honored to be invited to speak to you here today, and I very much look forward to hearing your thoughts and reflections on my work afterwards. As always, and of course, I wish I could actually be in Oxford now. This would be nothing less than a perfect excuse to visit the city and, and the university, and not the least the center again. I spent a semester there back in 2014. Doesn't feel that long, but it is. And I had the most wonderful time, I must say, with inspiring people and researchers and lecturers, internal and external ones. And that was just what I needed at that time, some food for thought, because I spent my time at Oxford writing mostly. And some of what I wrote made it into this book, uh, which is the topic of today's lecture. So research does take time. <laughs> so the topic of this talk will be based on this book, Advocates of Humanity, Human Rights NGOs in International Criminal Justice. And now this book builds on research on international criminal justice during the course of more or less a decade through my postgraduate and my PhD research uh, on which the book is actually based. And empirically, it is based on an analysis on the role of NGOs and especially human rights NGOs in international criminal justice. And why this focus on NGOs will become clear shortly, but the focus of the book isn't only on sort of mapping out the extent of NGO activities and influence. Other scholars have, have been concerned with that as well. But rather what I try to do is, is sort of to use the role of NGOs in international criminal justice as a point of departure for asking bigger and broader questions about the normative role of NGOs in the project of international criminal justice, or even the fight against impunity or the fight for global justice in their own terminology. As a criminologist and sociologist of law by background, I was interested in sort of what characterizes punishment gone global and how is international criminal justice constituted by and of the global? In other words, I was interested in the structures and the ideas that give shape to the field of international criminal justice. And not the least, presents criminal law as the most meaningful response to global violence and humanitarian emergencies. Now, today I will basically give an outline of some of the main arguments detailed in the book, and I will more or less follow the chapter outline, which means that after some introductory comments on research questions and methodology, methodology and approach, I will spend this talk trying more or less to dissect international criminal justice as a social field, focusing on the structures and the imaginaries that characterize it. This means that I will talk about spaces. Where does international criminal justice take place? I will talk about networks. How is it driven by connections and disconnections? And advocates, individuals and transnational activists. From this focus on how the field of international criminal justice is materially, materially structured, I will then move on to talk about the dominating discourses and mentalities in the field, especially in the human rights sensibility of international criminal justice. And as a way of sort of mapping out these imaginations of global justice, I focused first on the penal imagination of the field, then on how justice for victims are imagined and the role of humanitarian reason in driving the field of international criminal justice itself. Finally, I will address the que question of how international criminal justice 
relates to the work of crafting a global moral order, albeit one that is situated and political and dominant rather than universal as it claims to be. The last bit of this talk will therefore bring us back to where international criminal justice and more broadly perhaps multilateralism and liberal internationalism is today and how all of these accusations of it being now in crisis may also open up a space to be more critical and self-reflective about the pursuit of global justice through international criminal law. However, before dwelling into these arguments, I want to point out some of the paradoxes and unexpected challenges with international criminal justice that got me interested in this field altogether. Now, well over a decade ago, I wrote a master thesis on the different conceptualizations of justice for the conflict that had devastated the region of Northern Uganda for decades. At that time, uh, in 2006, if I don't remember wrong, the UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Jan Egeland, had described the situation in Northern Uganda as the biggest forgotten, neglected humanitarian emergency in the world and a quote unquote epicenter of terror. Today, of course, much more, much more is known about the conflict. Currently, we are awaiting um, the sentence of Dominic Nguyen pictured here in The Hague. However, in the course of the more 20 year long conflict, there were human rights report on the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army, under the leadership of the now infamous Joseph Kony, that, that they had abducted an estimated 30,000 children, forced them to become soldiers and sex slaves. And such children became their only source of conscripts as obviously this policy, policy fed discontent. And at the height of the conflict in 2001 to 2004, over 90% of its troops were abducted children, some of them as young as seven or eight years old. And to bind them permanently to this rebel group, they were also forced to commit atrocities against their own families and each other's so they had nowhere to go. However, under the pretext of protecting the local population, the Ugandan government forcibly displaced almost the entire Acholi population in the north into so-called protection villages. And these were camps, really, and the conditions there were just devastating. Besides reports of overt physical violence committed by the government soldiers, murder, rape, torture, they, were, they would also consider anyone outside of the camps to be a rebel and therefore a target. Adam Branch, among others, had paralleled these camps to concentration camps, given, as he says, that internment is an explicit government policy that targets the Acholi as a group and has led to tens or even hundreds of thousands of deaths and to the slow destruction of an entire ethnic group. So here enters the ICC, the newly established International Criminal Court. They enter into a situation where there are no big power politics involved. It wasn't Palestine, for instance. And it was a clear example of inhumanity, of sort of evil incarnate. On all accounts, the Ugandan situation was considered an easy first case for the court. However, it turned out to be far from that. First of all, when the ICC intervened in the conflict, it intervened in an ongoing peace talks between the warring parties, the LRA and the Ugandan government. When arrest warrants were issued for the five top commanders of the LRA, it meant that the LRA no longer had any incentive to lay down their arms as they would be sent to The Hague if they turned up to the peace table, to the, to the peace negotiations. In other words, the situation came to epitomize one of the most difficult dilemmas with justice in ongoing conflict, namely that between peace versus justice. Because this didn't fly very well with the local population, to put it that way. They, above all, wanted the fighting to stop, to return to their homes, to get back, to their, chil to get back their children and to carry on with their lives. Not necessarily to attain a form of justice which meant, in effect, that a few rebel commanders that at the time were sort of hiding in the bush 
that these would be sent um, or sort of get a green card to a European prison. They didn't see this as justice. It also didn't help that the local population's view of the ICC, that the court only had gone after one side of the conflict, a conflict that was a de facto civil war between the LRA and the Ugandan government. And this sort of selective approach to justice led the court to be seen as not only biased, but essentially a tool used by the Ugandan government to win the war. So this relates to another difficult dilemma with international criminal justice, namely the ICC's relation to state power. It's much easier for the ICC to go after state adversaries than to go after sitting heads of state, for instance, and we can talk about that afterwards. But Dominique Onguen, pictured here, is the only one from the Ugandan situation that has faced trial at The Hague. And he was himself abducted by the LRA at the age of 10, but grew up in the LRA to become one of the rebels group's commanders or top commanders. And now he is facing charges from crimes that he himself is also a victim of. Thus, his case epitomizes the whole issue of issue versus agent or agency and structure of individual accountability for collective, complex, and structural acts. Ongwen isn't necessarily the one who is most culpable of the violent conflict in Northern Uganda. So essentially this whole situation really revealed a huge gap in what justice meant to different people and not the least who really had a say in determining what justice is or should be. Generally, the local population didn't want ICC justice or see it as the primary solution to their conflict. Yet, this was what the international community called for, the ICC, the UN, and not the least, the human rights NGOs. Because finally, it showed the significant role of these NGOs. Because what I hadn't expected when I first started looking into this was how vocal and articulated and powerful human rights NGOs were in having a say about what kind of justice should be done and to whom. So indeed, when I started looking into the role of human rights NGOs in international criminal justice, they were practically everywhere. And they were also so steadfast in their belief in international criminal justice for mass violence. They were, simply put, at the forefront of the fight against impunity and Karen Engel with others that have, have edited an, an, a wonderful book about this. And I also quickly found that in the literature on the ICC and NGOs, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, were considered a quote unquote global civil society achievement, a product of mass organizations or of the masses by these NGOs and of these human rights NGOs in particular. And NGOs were, all, were also involved at almost every step in the criminal justice or the international criminal justice chain from setting conflicts and crimes on the international agenda to representing victims in court, to doing outreach, to explain what was going on in the court to local populations, to lobbying states to sign up to the court or to donate more money to the court and so on. So this major role that they had made me formulate a much broader research question driven mostly by curiosity because how can we understand the close relationship between global criminal justice making with global civil society and to get at this i broke that i broke the question down in three namely what is the role of international or what is the role of ngos in international criminal justice what characterizes punishment gone global? And how is international criminal justice constituted by and of the global? And as such, my analytic aim in the book is to develop a sociology of punishment for international criminal justice. And to do so, I build on a number of different disciplines and literatures, such as, of course, criminology and the subfield of uh, supranational criminology or uh, yeah, supranational criminology, which has sort of developed, although coming late to the table, now a substantial literature on international crimes and transitional justice. 
But I also draw extensively on international law and especially critical international law and critical international criminal justice scholarship. And a third major disciplinary strand is international relations theory and especially the body of work that deals with what is called transnational advocacy networks and transnational field theory drawing on or building on Bourdieu's work actually. And my approach was, uh, my methodological approach was ethnographic, but a somewhat unusual, maybe messy, and perhaps untraditional one as such. It was multi-sided and transnational, which meant that I spent a lot of time in the Netherlands and in The Hague, but in different places in, in The Hague. Uh, for example, diplomatic meetings at uh, offices of uh, human rights NGOs, but also at bars and pubs together with people that worked and lived in international criminal justice. But I also went to Uganda in particular to see what international criminal justice looked like from there, from the capital and from, and from the, the place where the conflict had, had occurred. So in the fact, I was tracing these NGO networks, which is one of the way you can do a global ethnography and or a multi-sided ethnography is to trace something. And I traced networks or NGO networks. As said, the dominant focus was in The Hague, but I wanted to travel to Uganda and see what international criminal justice looked like from, um, from one of the situations where the court was involved. And I have to say that even though it was a little bit uh, risky to do an ethnography of uh, a global connection, so to speak, it was also something that I really found extremely valuable because it, may be, it enabled me to question the taken for granted boundaries of the field. I could ask these stupid questions that the lawyers were taken for granted and also the international relations scholars were taken for granted. And I could sort of, like ethnography enables this critical impulse to engage with the question of boundaries, as I said, and to not take things for granted, but to try and objectivize and find your own research object. So I traveled a lot uh, to, to different parts. So I, international criminal justice is also a very academic field. So even so also my conference participations with practitioners such as judges uh, and diplomatic conferences were part of me trying to find out what kind of world is international criminal justice and how is this different, very different from the places where the crimes actually occur and where the people who are sort of who justice, whose justice is supposed to be for um, are based. So Spaces and places of international criminal justice. This chapter basically maps out where international criminal justice takes place. And one of my absolute motivations for mapping it out as such was because, because of the fact that international law has this sort of innate quality of always invoking the universal as if it is beyond space, beyond the situatedness and beyond the political. Therefore, to me, it became important to show that it is not, and that it is in fact anchored in concrete places, in particular practices and in particular people, such as The Hague, the global city of justice making, as I call it, and where international justice is visible and it's celebrated. If you want to visit international criminal justice, to put it that way, The Hague is it. The city also heavily promotes itself as a global city of justice, and I unpack what I call a moral economy there, where the celebration of global justice is embedded and beneficial to the, to the municipal economy of The Hague. And I contrast this celebratory image of justice or global justice in The Hague with Uganda, with Uganda where justice is almost invisible. When I did my field work, the ICC and the international NGOs were closed off behind compounds. And in the north, where the survivors of the conflict are, the ICC didn't actually have a physical presence at all. So there were no door to knock on, so to speak, for the victims of international crimes. So basically, I argue that there is a disconnect between the metropole and the periphery of global justice making which is also apparent in other spaces of international justice. And I won't 
go more into that now, but I also analyze social media, which is an important space for promoting and legitimizing international justice and the assembly of states parties meetings, which are annual diplomatic meetings of the court. But what that chapter does is to sort of tease out the north south and, and metropole periphery divide in international criminal justice while situating these transnational networks of NGOs as part of what I call international criminal justice geography of power. And having sort of established where international criminal justice takes place, the next chapter analyzes how these NGOs organize in order to promote the ICC. And in particular, I deconstruct the network structures of NGOs at the ICC and the centrality of this coalition for the International Criminal Court and its core member NGOs, such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. And I basically show that these networks, while claiming to represent global civil society and, and over 2,500 organizations worldwide, it really comes down to the power of about 10 organizations of larger Western-based human rights organizations that speak for the rest in a way. And I also show that while human rights NGOs serve an important role in international criminal justice as providers of moral authority, they are too embedded in the field of international criminal justice to really claim a position of being neutral or disinterested others that can speak truth to power, which is arguably what has given them um, their power elsewhere, especially vis-a-vis -vis states. I then probe deeper into the people uh, that work on and for international criminal justice, specifically those that advocate for humanity. What motivates them? How do they envision justice? And what is their everyday life working on these issues? And what became clear here from just sort of hanging out in The Hague is that international criminal justice is also a lifestyle. Therefore, this chapter turns attention to what is often downplayed in studies of international law, namely the issue of class. The question that this chapter probes is thus essentially the issue of whose imaginations of global justice become part of its materiality. Who gets to speak for humanity and for justice? And perhaps not surprisingly, it finds that advocates of humanity predomin predominantly belong to a class of transnational Western professionals. So during my field work, for example, of all, all, of, all except one of the NGO representatives that were lobbying in The Hague were white um, or from your Europe and one from Canada. Uh, and this was at a time when the court itself was only involved at the African continent. It's also a field driven by internships. Uh, about a third of the people that work, quote unquote, at the ICC are interns and also at these NGOs. But who can afford to work for free for up to two years in one of the most expensive cities in Europe, in the world, right? And who even gets a visa to just hang around in that city and wait perhaps for a job opportunity? And these sort of structural inequalities are also mirrored at the ICC. So when I did my research, the five countries with the topmost professionals working there were France, who had 45 professionals staffed there, United Kingdom with 27, the Netherlands 17, Canada 15, and Germany 13. By comparison, the situation countries, that is where the ICC was involved, Cote d'Ivoire, the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Mali, and Uganda, they had two professionals each working at the court. And I know that these numbers can change, and I'm sure that they have by now, because there is an increasing focus uh, and have for a while been on geographical representations in the institutions of international criminal justice. But still, these sort of simple observations illustrate some of the disconnections and inequalities that are structurally embedded in the field. Anyway, from having sort of mostly focused on the structures embedded in and productive of international criminal justice, the latter part of the book focused more on the dominating discourses, assumptions, and mentalities in the field. And chapter five then 
analyzes the cosmopolitan penal imaginary building on Western domestic penality, delving into the relationship between human rights sensibilities and criminal justice mentalities in the fight against impunity for international crimes. Because while non-punitive forces have a major place in the human rights sensibility, indeed to the extent that the penal aspects of international criminal justice is given uncomfortably little weight, human rights have also become a force of punitivism. And I show how this is particularly apparent uh, in human rights NGOs approach to amnesties and that in the fight against impunity, human rights NGOs are at the forefront of penal policies with global objectives and global capacities. And drawing on mainstream criminology and applying a sociology of punishment perspective to the field of international criminal justice, the chapter bring, brings out the similarities and differences in the penal imaginations between domestic and international criminal justice. And I find that crucially, international criminal justice is imagined and promoted by its advocates as a form of social justice, albeit on a, on a cosmopolitan scale. And I argued that while international criminal justice relies upon retributive and expressive undertones, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't make any appeal to sort of punitive sensibilities in the way that we usually think of punitive sensibilities. And I argued that this fact can be understood in light of this close relation between international criminal justice and human rights NGOs. And through the fieldwork in Uganda and Rwanda, I describe how asymmetries and tensions emerge in international criminal justice, particularly between the national and the international as international criminal justice both echoes the national and departs from it. For example, a lot of practical issues had simply not been thought of when setting up the ICC, such as the issue of acquittals or asylum seeking witnesses. Yet human rights NGOs, they rely too strongly on punitive answers and amnesties can also be just sort of a a matter of pragmatism in situations of profound violence, as we saw in Uganda. Thus, while the ICC has both sort of punitive and reparative aims, the situation in northern Uganda demonstrates how international criminal justice also became an impediment to peace because of this punitive and legalistic approach. So part of that chapter also lays the foundation for an article that was just published in Punishment and Society, um, penal wealth has gone global. But moving on, the figure of the victim is the sine qua non of the fight against impunity for international crimes. And much has been written about this by now. And the chapter shows how victims are represented and how justice for victims is imagined in international criminal justice. And the first part focuses on imaginations of justice for victims and argues that the ICC represents a form of hybrid justice uh, drawing also on, on uh, Carolyn Hoyle and Leila Ulrich's work by incorporating restorative and transformative rationales for justice. Yet, a closer look at the implementation of these processes reveal a conspicuous discrepancy between the ideologies and the realities in international justice making. And the second part of the chapter sees victims may be provocatively so as a source of moral authority and one that is claimed in representational practices by both human rights NGOs and international criminal justice generally. And I explore suffering as a type of currency, both on an individual level for victims advocates as their sort of, sort of um, their source of purpose and on a broader cultural level as the source of global moral outcry. And the chapter demonstrate how the victim is culturally represented through imaginations from the global north and becomes universalized as a symbol of humanity, of which the gendered and the racialized victim of sexual and gender-based violence provides a particularly powerful victim imagery. The argument is also refined in cooperation with Annette bringing all Hauge in this article. And in this way, the image of the victim of international crime is characterized in a sense by her essential otherness. It is, she is humanity that suffers. So having explored sort of the cultural authority of the ICC, the NGOs claim for 
advocacy of humanity and the moral authority of victims, the final analytic chapter addresses the pivotal question, who are we who punish? To what extent can international criminal justice be understood to reflect bonds of common values and beliefs, tradition and interests on the global scale? And as apt for analysis that positions punishment at the center of social organization, the chapter cultivates a Dokimian approach to global justice making and argues that international criminal justice reinforces a social imaginary of cosmopolitan solidarity embodied in the notion of humanity. And this chapter thus demonstrates how agents of international criminal justice argue their cases and punish in the name of humanity. However, rather than something given, the cosmopolitan moral order embodied by humanity reflects a dominant moral order and one that is actively constituted in large part by these human rights NGOs. For instance, using the ICC statute as sort of a crowd bar for penal aid and rule of law promotion in the global south, I show how global justice making through international criminal law is intertwined with the promotion of rule of law and penal aid in context of failed justice, where cosmopolitan values, or more specifically the cosmopolitan penal imaginary, are supposed to sort of naturally spread through the notion of positive complementarity, as I call it. A global justice making through international criminal justice is thus, I argue, a multi-scalar project and one which, although done so in the name of solidarity, is coercively and deliberately implemented. And in this way, I hope to show how a sociological approach to international criminal justice reveals some of the ways in which moral, personal, and social order is sought constituted globally. And the final chapter situates some of the book's major findings within contemporary resistance towards international criminal justice as global justice. It addresses how current pushback against international criminal justice is part of the move towards a multipolar or a multi-regional system of international relations. But it also, that the pushback that we've seen is a result of the unevenness and the tensions and the disconnections as revealed throughout the book's analysis. So to revisit the research objectives, what is the role of NGOs in international criminal justice? I say that they contribute moral authority to international criminal justice. What characterizes punishment gone global? Well, a lot, but it is driven by a humanitarian reason. And how is international criminal justice constituted by and of the global? Well, it consolidates unequal power structures. And with that, I finish with a little question for us. Well, the question remains, what could be done to remedy these disconnections, unevennesses, and well, power inequalities embedded in the field of international criminal justice? Thank you.